know, although hopefully if I've been doing my job, everyone in here does know that Nears Green was the first African-American master distiller on record in the United States and the first to have a bottle after his own name. Yeah. That is Uncle Nears Green. a part-time whiskey reporter, part-time civil rights activist, if you will, from Nashville. He received a, he, I'll tell you what he told me. He received sort of a, a pitch for all of these different things about black history and like all these different things to talk about, about black history. And one of the items mentioned a man by the name of New York Spring. And he did a little research and there was literally nothing online about this man. This was in 2016. But the more he dug, the more he realized there might be a story. So he started digging into it. And and he put out the story in June, June 28, 2000 and June 25th, 2016. I was in Singapore. And I know that it was meant for me to read the story because when I'm in the States, I don't read the New York Times. But every time I travel internationally, I read the New York Times. And it was on the cover of the New York Times. And I looked at it and I read the story and I said, if there is any truth to this story, it is one of the most remarkable stories in African American history to have never been told. And if I have the opportunity to tell it, I am going to do it. So for the next, I don't know, a little while, I was trying to convince my husband to let us go to Lynch Bird. <laughs> now, I assure you, and every black male in here can tell you, we don't want to go to a city called Lynch anything. And he was just not interested. And every day I would bring it up, and he was not interested. And finally I said, it's my 40th birthday. I want to go to Lynchburg. He's like, I'm planning Paris. We can go there by way of Lynchburg. <laughs> so we go, and, and, and I wanted to interview the descendant of Nearest that was in the New York Times. So I pick up the phone, and I call him. Very easy to Google him. He's, he's 92 years, 93 now. So we didn't realize the Yellow Pages was now all online. I knew his address, I knew his telephone number, I knew his cousins. And, and I called him and I said, you know, Mr. E, I'm, I'm Vaughn Weaver, I'm an author, my husband's an executive vice president for Sony Pictures. We think there might be a book in this, we think there might be a movie in this. Do you mind if I come down and interview you? And he says, well, I'm 92 years old, and I can't tell you where I'll be in two weeks if I'll still be alive. But if I'm still alive, you can come and interview me. And two weeks later, I showed up at his door, and I knocked on the door, and he had this surprised look on his face, and I thought, well, maybe I should call first. He is 92 years old. His wife later told me he was expecting an old white lady. <laughs> And as we were talking, we were talking about the story, which he knew nothing about. He didn't even know how he was related to Nearest. All he knew is that he, his mother told him he was somehow related, and he heard what Nearest had done. He heard that he was this distiller, but he didn't know anything more than that. So the longer I talked to him, the more I realized, well, I'm not going to get any new information here. So I began asking about life at Lynchburg. I began asking about what's your experience? Again, the name is Lynchburg. And he's at the time 92 years old. And he starts describing this wonderful city. And he's talking about these different families and, and, and talking about what life was like and what they went through. And, and the longer he talked, the more I realized he wasn't distinguishing between black families and white families. He was talking about them because 
they all live side by side, they work side by side, there was an equality among them, which I couldn't quite wrap my head around because it was called, I hate to say it, Lynchburg. And so I'm sitting and I'm talking and this wife, who was a fourth grade teacher for 40 years. So she went through integration, she went through that whole process, and I remember board versus route of education and just kind of what that looked like. And I remember seeing the National Guard on, like I remember all of these different things. And so I said to her, what was integration like for you? And almost without even thinking, she says it was a non-issue. You guys saw the pictures of the National Guard with Brown Board of Education, right? And in a city called Lynchburg, it was a non-issue. And I said, well, how could it have been a non-issue? She said, well, the kids were actually excited they were going to go to school together because they were already playing with each other before school and after school and all the weekends. So they were just happy they were now going to be able to go to school together. I said, so let me get this straight. They were playing together in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Do I have to? And she's like, yeah. So what would they do? Oh, they, they would play in the creeks. They would go and they'd run around and, and, and they would. I said, so at the same time that Dorothy Dandridge puts her toe in a pool in Las Vegas, they drain the pool. You're telling me that the kids of Lynchburg, black and white, were playing together? It was that moment that I knew this story had to be written. It was at that moment that I knew this story was actually bigger than yours. So I began contacting all of Miris's descendants, and I brought together in a church all of the African American elders of Lynchburg. There were about 50 of them that all came. And I asked them to tell their stories, and I figured maybe they had a different experience from everyone else. If you bring all a bunch of African American elders together in the same room, there's nothing that prevents them from telling the truth. I mean, they're so old at this point, they don't have to lie. Like, they're, they are fully free. They can say whatever they want. And story after story after story was life here was beautiful. Life here was amazing. But as I would ask them about near screen one by one, none of them knew anything. Except he was a distiller. But they didn't know anything more than that. But they knew all of his family. So one by one, I began interviewing the family. And they're like, we can't prove it, but this is what we understand to be. We can't prove it, but this is what we think it is. We can't prove it. And I realized that if we were going to tell this story, we had to be able to prove it. So I put together a team of about 20 archaeologists, archivists, genealogists, and throughout the country, four documents from six different states. I interviewed over 100 people. And this is what I know to be true. Nearest Green was born in Maryland sometime around the 1820s. We find him in Lynchburg around the 1850s. Have no idea where he was in between. And that seems hard to believe, but if you think about it this way, until 1865, African Americans were not citizens, we were property. So it is almost like trying to track cattle from Maryland to Tennessee. It's impossible. There's no records. And so we see him in Lynchburg in the middle of the 1850s, and he's working on a farm for a distiller and a preacher who doesn't have any records of owning slaves. So it's more likely than not he was renting Nearest because Nearest was already a very skilled distiller. If you've ever seen like these ads from Andrew Jackson when he was looking for his, his runaway slave and he put ads all throughout Tennessee and it said, I'm looking for my runaway slave. He is my best slave. He's my distiller. See, the distillers, there was a price for them that was very high. So for a lot of people, they just rented them. I have no idea who nearest the slave owner is. That I don't know. I know his last name, Green, matches the last name of the largest slave owner in the area at the time, Townsend P. Green, and nearest his grandson is named Townsend Green. 
and it is the history of slaves as we would name our children and our grandchildren after the slave owner. Because we only knew so many names. So that was pretty common. So I'm pretty sure I know the slave owner, but I can't tell you. Or what I can tell you is he was on the farm, and he was the man who ran that distillery. The white preacher and distiller, he, he had to make a choice. And I, I heard uh, a historian, Nelson Eddy, was doing a thing on Bourbon Daily yesterday, and he was telling us this story. And he said, the preacher had to decide which spiritual, <laughs> which, he, he, had, he had to decide which spiritual calling he was going to stick with. His congregation and his wife were both saying, get out, get out of the distilling business. And he chose to get out of the distilling business. Sort of. It was still on his property, but the property was 313 acres, so he could be in his home and not have to worry about the distillery because the distillery was fine all by itself because Nearest was the boss. And he had workers for him putting out the best whiskey there was in the area. And somewhere around the, in the mid-1850s, definitely before the mid-1860s, there is a, a young white boy that comes to live on the farm as a chore boy. He lost his mother at the age of four months. He was the tenth child. So it was not an easy upbringing for him. He had to figure out pretty early on how to fend for himself. So he began to work at this local farm, and he began to work for this preacher and his wife. And he'd go and he'd go fetch water from the well, he'd milk the cows, he'd run after the pigs, he did everything that a chore boy would do. This little boy's life was not privileged in the least. And he would always see the smoke coming up through the hollow down on the other side and say, hey, what's going on over there? Now, what I do know is he already knew what was going on over there because his father had a little moonshine going on on his own property. And, and so he'd always ask about that. And over time, he proved himself to be as young and as little as he was to be a great worker. So finally, the preacher and distiller said, listen, I will show you what's over there. If you want to know how to do what we're doing over there, I'll show you that. So he takes him over there, and he introduces him to a, his book says, a cold black Negro. And he says, this is Uncle Harris. He's the best whiskey maker I know of. And the preacher asked Uncle Dearest to teach the young boy how to make whiskey his way, which was what we now know to be Tennessee whiskey. And as the years go by, this young boy becomes this amazing entrepreneur and businessman. And he'll take the whiskey and he'd go out and he'd sell it to the soldiers. And as he got a little older, he would take the whiskey and he'd take it out and sell it in the general stores and sell it in all the different stores. And, and he became, as little as he was, he never grew to over five foot two, as little as he was, he overcame all of that because he was just this brilliant business mind and he knew what he wanted, which was for his name to go around the world. After the Civil War, he began his own distillery on that same property, which if anyone has done it in, or read any interviews that I've done, we own that 313 acre property where Nearest talked to the young boy and where the preacher and the distiller were. And the original distillery was there. And he put his name on it, and he put his name on the jugs. And as time went on, he went and he purchased a distillery location that had better water flow and all the rest of this good stuff down the street. And Nearest decided to retire. He decided not to go to the new distillery. But Nearest's children, three of his boys, Lewis, George, and Pop, all went to, I'm sorry, Lewis, George, and Eli, all went to the distillery. Then George's children, Charlie and Ott would later join them. And they continued to help the young man to build this business. And over time, his name would travel around the world and he would be known as the most famous whiskey maker in the world. You, of course, know him to be Jack Daniel. And the young African-American slave, well, not young, old, his mentor, his teacher, his first master distiller, his story would be lost in time. And so him. So thank you, because I believe with every bone in my body that 
that there are two people, three people in heaven who have been playing puppy strings with this story. My niece who passed away, which is truly is a part that I skipped in this story because it's still a very difficult thing for me. She was like a daughter to me. And she passed away right after I read the original story. And the true reason why I dug into this and why I found myself in Lynchburg is because I didn't want to grieve. And the easiest way not to grieve was to find something to dive into. So I dove into this story, but I believe the reason why she had me on this story is because I think she got to heaven and she saw one little white man and was really tall black man. And she saw them sitting next to each other and walked over there because they were welcoming and they were friendly and, and really quite frankly it's an odd sight. <laughs> and I believe with everything that is in me that my niece went over to them and they're talking about this story that has never really truly been told, that's never truly been given the honor and, and the distinction that it really is worthy of having. And I believe that she said to them, have you met my auntie Mom? She will tell this story, she will tell it with honor, she will tell it with love, she will tell it with respect. And she will make sure that the world knows who your screen was, but she will make sure that it is told in such a way where she builds the legacy of Nearest without harming the legacy of Jack. And every single one of you in here, I want to thank you because when you leave here today, you will continue to build the legacy of Nearest without harming the legacy of Jack. Thank you. Yeah.